Perfect. Welcome, everyone. This is River Development School Waterway Identification and Management. My name is Christy Pellin. I'm the program director for She Jumps. And this is River School. <laughs> she Jumps increases the participation of women and girls in the outdoors. Partnering with nature, She Jumps creates safe educational outdoor experiences for girls and women that nurture growth and transformation. In short, we are outdoor play that transforms. River School began way back with actually Alpine Finishing School. Since we've expanded the progression series of Alpine Finishing School, we went from hiking to ski mountaineering and created every step along the way. So you can start with our hiking series and get all the way up to the finishing series with ski mountaineering. We applied the same curriculum format to our river activities. We're achieving our goal of impact with more women and girls, regardless of their geographic location or access to terrain through this method. Another step to ensure She Jumps programs can reach as many communities as possible by offering unique, thorough, and thoughtful programming. Through online and in-person events curated by world-renowned guides, the She Jumps River School offers everything from technical instruction to environmental stewardship and mentorship through fly fishing courses. She Jumps River School is presented by Orvis, along with additional support from both Patagonia and Yeti to help advance the number of women participating in fly fishing. Tonight's host for River Development School are Whitney Malone, Whitney, sorry, Milhone, and Hillary Hutchinson. Whitney was raised on the doorstep of Glacier National Park. Whitney developed a passion for the outdoors early in life. She spent nearly a decade as a fly fishing and whitewater rafting guide on the Flathead River, working her way through a degree in sociology from the University of Montana. Over the past dozen years, Whitney has worked exclusively with nonprofits utilizing outdoor therapies to promote physical and emotional healing, most recently serving as the executive director for Casting for Recovery. Whitney is currently pursuing her MBA with concentration in healthcare and plans to continue her focus on opportunities and inequities in the intersection of outdoor experience and health and wellness. She lives in Bridger, the Bridger Mountains with two dogs, three wild children and a patient husband. Together, they enjoy fishing, skiing, and exploring wild places. Hillary started her fly fishing career as a teenage guide in West Glacier, Montana. She guided through college, then took her journalism degree to Portland, Oregon, where she worked as a television news anchor and reporter. She eventually returned to Montana to co-own and operate outside media and trout TV for nearly a decade. Today, she's guiding on the Flathead River and the Middle Fork of the Salmon River and owns and runs a fly shop called Larry's Fly and Supply in her hometown of Columbia Falls, Montana. She is a climate activist, protect our winners. Hillary is an ambassador for Orvis, Patagonia, Yeti, Scientific Anglers, Costa, and Loon. Needless to say, tonight you all are in really good hands. <laughs> I now turn it over to Hillary Whitney for River Development School, Waterway Identification and Management. Yay. Thank you so much, Christy. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Um, I want to start with a huge shout out to Christy and Claire and Angela and Yulia, the whole team at She Jumps. Um, this has been, we're super excited and have been super honored to partner on River School um, and just really grateful to be here. And secondly, big thank you to everyone joining, either watching now or watching the recording later. I know that summers are crazy and the last thing you probably wanted to do was sit down in front of a screen again um, in the evening so thank you so much for for being here and participating and being part of this um, a couple of things I wanted to mention before we get started this this is a broad audience so all experience levels all walks of life um, I hope that everything that we go through tonight um, will have you know different levels of application for each of you. So some of the things that we talk about might be brand new and exciting, and some of it might be old hat. And I hope if that's the case that we can kind of broach a deeper meaning to all of these different elements that go into fly fishing. Um, that said, I wanna encourage you guys to use the Q&A. So if you have a question, please interrupt us if there's something, if it's, if it's boring, or you know, every, you have already heard it all or have a different question or want us to dig into something a little more, please go ahead. Um, we want it to be as interactive as possible, even virtually. So throw those questions um, up into the Q&A chat um, any old time. 
Um, so just to, some of this will be redundant if you joined last night, so I'll make it brief, but, but Hillary and I have a shared philosophy in our approach to fishing. Um, and it really is centered around stewardship first. So we feel that if we prioritize stewardship, it makes us better anglers, it makes us better people, makes us better moms, it makes us better global citizens. Um, so that is really the driver of um, our decision making and our process through fly fishing experiences. We also believe in angling for all, which means um, there is space here for everyone. Um, fly fishing is not an elite or exclusive club, um, regardless of what some of the <laughs> some things you might hear or are said. Um, so we're really focused on inclusivity um, in all aspects. And then lastly, building your process. And what we mean by this is we've really designed these courses to try to share the tools and knowledge that you need to get into the driver's seat of your fly fishing experiences. So that means beyond waiting to, to know cast here or this use this fly or here's the knot, but we really wanna dig into the why. Um, why is the river moving that way? What does it mean for the fish? What does that mean for you as the angler? What does that mean for the whole ecosystem? And we both feel that that why is mostly skipped over in fly fishing courses. So it goes from, you wanna learn to fish, here's the technical tools you need, and then here's the success, here's the outcome. And um, by doing that, we really do ourselves a disservice by not being part of that process and part of that journey um, throughout. And so with that in mind, we have built the course tonight um, with the goal of trying to dig into how rivers work. Like where, what is that water? Where is it coming from? What does that mean for the fish? And what does that mean for you as the angler? Um, so in terms of what to expect, we're going to get into some of the why in terms of rivers and, and how they move. Um, and so what not to expect, we're not going to do any sort of specific skills review or other common things that you might typically expect from a fly fishing course. We're not going to talk about casting. We're not going to talk about specific flies or bugs. Um, we're not going to talk about specific technical gear. Um, however, all of those elements are critically important. And so um, we've put together a workbook that you will receive that has links to a multitude of resources that you should take advantage of. So Christy mentioned our sponsor for this program is Orbis. Orbis has a phenomenal online learning center. Um, we also link to a bunch of other partners and, and resources in the workbook that would uh, really can encourage you to explore. So definitely take check that out. Um, okay, so our topic tonight is reading water, accessing water, and ultimately understanding your role as a steward and then your role as an angler um, in navigating that water. So I want to start, Hillary, um, back at the beginning when, you know, it's, it's a common term. I'm sure anyone who has had any sort of introduction to fishing has heard someone say reading water. And I want to just want to back up and, and ask you, what are we, what does that mean? When, when we say reading water, what does that mean? So if we start at the beginning, right. so we're all on the same page about what we're referring to. Well, I think it's a super good point that a lot of times, especially women, when we're taught, we want that deeper meaning. We want to learn more about the why, as opposed to just being told, put the fly here. So then when we hear about reading water, reading water is not see this rock, that's a good place for a fish to be, put the fly there. It's understanding how is the rock there? Why is the rock there? Then what does that mean for the fish? And what does that mean for my place in this river? And how do I need to present the fly? How do I need to present myself? What can I do to make that rock matter um, in my ultimate success and also my safety? So um, reading water truly by definition is identifying and understanding the features and characteristics that might either define or alter the currents. And what's happening with those currents uh, is then impacting all of the stakeholders. And that would be fish, people, plants, uh, other animals, insects, and maybe other parts of the river. So 
um, that's reading water. Reading water is just identifying those features and characteristics and understanding them and what those features and characteristics are doing to define and alter the currents. And then understanding what happens after that, what's happening with the current after something has altered it, because then it's going to continue to have a domino effect. That current is going on to push somewhere else. Um, the things that are coming down river are going to go somewhere else. So reading water is taking a broad view and then narrowing down to understand the pieces, the bites that you need to take out of it to one, keep yourself safe and to two, have more success and more fun in fly fishing. That's awesome. I think it's, um, I, I like to break it down like that because it, the question really is who cares? Like, why? Why do I need to know how to read the water rather than just pinpoint or memorize techniques that work? Right. And, and um, so I, I love that simple definition of this is going to help you help your success and also your safety. And I think it really is that, that simple. Um, so in, in terms of understanding the river or the water, um, how does that relate back to stewardship? Well, you know, when we talk about reading water mattering because it can um, determine your safety and your success on the river, if we're thinking about our safety and our success first, then we've missed the big picture of putting the water first. And so when we think about stewardship, that needs to be key before we're even kind of thinking about our fun, right? So in, in when you were talking about kind of our philosophy in the beginning, our philosophy with stewardship is rooted on that you first need to commit to protecting the resource and then you can go out there and have fun. So um, before you even get to that get on the water part, there's that committing to understanding the water. And when you start to understand the water, then you start to speak its language and it's its own language. You know, river does speak its own language. And, and if you aren't interested in learning it or hearing it, then you're really, in my personal opinion, cheating yourself out of so much fun, success, and a deeper understanding of the outdoors in general. So when you start to read water and you start to learn that language, then things become so much more clear. So like learning any other language or starting to take bites out of learning those other languages, you're going to learn why a fish might be in a certain spot and what that matters to you, how you can start to access that spot, where you should wade and where you should not wade and why how far you should cast and why. Sometimes um, you'll see people who don't know how to read water will cast as far as they can until they start to hear and learn the language of the mm -hmm. river. Then they realize that they maybe need to cast a, a fourth of the, the way um, because right. there are so many river elements that are between them and that place they used to cast. Um, because now you've started to read water, learn water, hear that language. And um, that'll help you understand how far to drift the fly down river, maybe where to position yourself in the river to get better capitalization on um, your cast. Uh, these things shouldn't just be that somebody says to you, stand here, cast at a 45 degree exactly. angle, let it drift this far and do it again. It, it's not that mechanical if you're starting mm. to read water because you're learning that there are so many different elements that go into helping you make that decision about where to stand, where to walk, where yeah. to row, where to position your body and your boat, how far to cast, how long to drift. Um, and so that's why it matters to fishing when it matters as a steward is that when you're thinking of the water first. So when you're thinking mm. of where is the water coming from and where is it going? You're somewhere there in between and then you're able to put yourself in a role that helps you protect it. Because once you learn that language, now you're speaking the language and now you can speak for the river and help it. For sure. And I love that, um, you know, key takeaway of being able to read water will not only improve your success, but, but deepen your experience. Like, and I really think that happens. And, and, and once you start to read water, you don't ever look at water the same. You're always wondering where are the headwaters, how, what's this whole ecosystem like? So I think that's awesome. Um, so now that we've kind of talked about this concept of reading water, what it is before we move forward, um, we're going to need to use a lot of different yeah. uh, terms and a lot of different language to describe um, the waterways that we're going to identify. So I just want to have you quickly run us through what are some of those common features 
Um, and what is some of the terminology that we'll hear um, over the course of the evening when we're talking about waterway identification? Yeah, and one thing that's a little bit unfortunate is having to say quickly run through these things because these things do take time to, to soak in and then to also practice just kind of like any practice that you're becoming proficient at. Um, and so that's why we put together that workbook that everybody has um, access to as soon as this is over, you'll get the link that has the recording for this and then also that workbook. And that will have all of this stuff in there, including uh, digital links for more training on it. So when you said what not to expect, we're not gonna give you all of the exact training of where to stand and where to do, but we do want to give you those tools. So that's in the workbook. Um, if you look at the photo in this slide, this is me guiding on the middle fork of the salmon. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a dynamic river. It's, you know, got a lot of rapids and a lot going on there, as you can see, but it's also excellent fly fishing. So <clears throat> if you continue to reference this picture as I'm going through some of these, I'll be pointing out some of the features that um, you can see throughout different rivers. And then hopefully you'll start to visualize them a little bit better on your own river. And of course, since everybody's river is a little bit different, some of your rivers will have a lot of these features and some won't have as many. And that will be later in this presentation too, we'll talk about why the different kinds of rivers that are out there and why certain rivers have certain features and why some don't. So um, I think the first one that most people are really familiar with is an eddy. And an eddy is going to be the calm or swirling water that's just behind an obstruction. Typically the obstruction is a rock boulder or um, an outcropping of river, so a river bend or a river gap. And um, whatever that obstruction is, is forcing the faster water to go around it. If it's a river bend, it's pushing the river around that bend or that outcropping in the river. And then as the fast water moves past, it's creating kind of a harbor in the other side of it that then also can be recirculating, in which case the water that is pushing past, some will get into that recirculation and will look like it's flowing upstream back along the bank. And so that can be a recirculating eddy can go fast or it can be very calm. Uh, it's important for fishing because a lot of times that can be a place that is safe for you to stand and then also start to look at the river in terms of the next features that we'll talk about and identifying those features. It could also be a place for fish to take harbor and um, chill out and wait for food to come by the seam, which is the next feature. So a seam is going to be the line that's in between the fast water and that eddy or still water, calm water, kind of recirculating water. The reason a seam is important is because where the seam line is, is typically where you'll see food coming down like a conveyor belt, food being, being bugs typically. So the bugs are kind of getting caught up in that seam and floating down over that seam. Fish can sit in the seam and come up and eat, but a lot of times they'll want to be in the softer water or the slow, calm water of the eddy. So they'll harbor there and wait so that they're not uh, wasting energy. Fish really want to conserve energy and make the most out of every meal. So they're going to wait in the calm water. And then when they're ready to eat, kind of push out into the seam, come up and eat or go down and eat however they're eating. And, um, and that seam is typically a really effective place to put a fly. Um, it's also a great place to start to practice things like mending. So we've given you in your workbook, all the terminology and, and 101 information for how to do things like cast and mend. And your mend is going to be affected by different speeds of the water. And you'll see that very specifically within a seam and an eddy. A pillow is going to be the water that's pushed upward in front of an obstruction like a rock. So the water that's hitting a solid object, a lot of times will push up and as opposed to kind of come down into a hole that we'll talk about later. So the water will push up and often go around it. That smooth part that it's pushing up on, on the hard surface of the rock is a pillow. That's actually a super, super cool place. One of my favorite places to um, put a fly is on the head of a pillow there because a lot of times fish can surf the pillow. It's super fun. It ends up being a little bit of an advanced um, feature for, for casting a fly, but it's a very fun and interesting thing to identify as you're continuing to read water. 
uh, it's not a great place to put your body. Um, you never want to put your body or your boat uh, in between an obstruction and, and you know, fast moving water. So that pillow, which is right there in front of an obstruction is not a super safe place to put yourself. You can end up in some wrapping situations, some flipping situations, and uh, it's, it's best to access that with a cast safely from one side or another, or with a safe drift. Um, next feature is a pocket. Pocket water fishing is another super fun uh, way to fish some of these reading water terminology features. Um, in the picture that you can see here on the screen, this one's gonna be full of pocket water. So the pockets are the softer pieces of water that might be created into little eddies behind or to the sides of rocks created by all of the different features of the fast moving water around it. So when you see pockets, it's going to be a bit of a bucket of softer water or kind of still or holding um, swirling water where a fish can hold and chill out in the middle of all that fast water and also bugs will be holding in there too. So you'll find fish sitting kind of harboring behind rocks or in those pockets. They're able to come up and eat, but it is like video games. It is get the fly in there and then quick get it out. We don't love to pull fish through fast water. So it's up to the guide typically um, or your boatman, yourself, whoever you're, is holding the boat there with a um, rowing arm to be able to hold in that pocket water. So you're able to release a fish in the same place as opposed to pulling it through. So another advanced piece of fly fishing that's something to understand in terms of terminology. So when people talk about fishing pocket water, you certainly can also fish pocket water from the shore, kind of walking along the banks and seeing pockets is a very fun way to identify reading water. Um, runs and riffles. So a run and a riffle are going to both be consistent in the amount of water that is pushing through, but a riffle will be over rocky, shallow areas of the river. And a run is typically going to be a more uh, deeper, more moderate, consistent push of volume. So um, the, the key with a riffle and a run is that there's typically not a lot of obstructions in them and not a lot of bends. It's typically going to be pretty consistent, which means it looks delicious. Like you'll approach a riffle or run and you'll just think it's that classic, beautiful trout water. And what that can do, that's like a siren, like a muse, like calling you to, to get out there, which can be a very big mistake. Whitney, explain why that's a huge mistake to just go right into the run or right into the riffle muted. <laughs> uh, thank you. That's why that's why there's two of us. Yeah. Um yeah, I think that you, the awesome thing about riffles and runs is they are attractive, but some of the as you start to read water, some of the most you'll rec start to recognize them right away as fishy. Like you know there that that fish hold in there, all of that moving water, that riffle, the run it means it's aerated. Um so it's a healthy habitat for fish. The trouble is if you go straight to the run or even straight to the riffle, you might be overshooting other opportunities for fish. So there might be an eddy on the inside of that um, bent river bend. Um, there might be a seam um, at the top of that, that riffle or run. And so you just wanna make sure when you're stepping back and, and looking at your water first that you're not actually overshooting um, any little features just to get to the run. Yeah, I like- to do. <clears throat> I have a term called piecing out and I, I like to piece out the river by starting close to me and kind of working out toward the thing that looks like the meaty run. When I'm guiding, a lot of times I end up telling people to go for the meat, fish the meat. Like that means the, the hearty, delicious, thick piece of the run right in the middle, but I'll never ask them to do that first. We work our way out um, to the main course. And a lot of times the bigger, stronger fish will be in the deeper run. Um, of course, every river is different, but that's just because they are strong enough to kind of be there. The big foods coming through there consistently, they're strong enough to be there. So a lot of times there'll be big fish there. We never will just go straight to that um, because there's you're just gonna be casting over fish the entire time. So um, like to work our way out to that. And of course, always keeping in mind that the middle of a run may not be the safest place for you also. So if you can't reach the middle of the run, it doesn't matter. 
because there are all of these rad features all around it and you don't always have to get out there and fish the meat of the run. So riffles are, like you said, and I should have talked about in the pocket water too, um, super aerated. So you've got a lot of water moving. That's where the fish are getting their oxygen is in that aerated kind of dynamic water. Um, but a riffle will offer less cover. So a riffle is shallow going over sometimes gravel bars, but you know, kind of um, lower angle rocks <clears throat> and it doesn't have as much gradient. So um, there's not a lot of shelter for fish from predators like eagles and osprey. So a lot of times in a riffle, you might just have fish kind of coming through, hanging out, trying to eat, and then getting back to a place where one, they can find shelter from predators and two, they can chill out a little bit and they don't have to hold in that upstream uh, position and, and they want to conserve energy, not waste it. So um, a rapid, like in the picture that you see here, uh, is obviously a very dynamic place. It's a fun place to be if you're equipped to be there. It's going to mean that there's going to be some changes to your program if you're not typically fishing in rapids and whitewater fly fishing is a thing, but I like for people to understand what it is and know it's its own thing as opposed to um, just fish the same way in every single river condition. Whitewater fly fishing is something to learn, something to a lot of times um, maybe adapt other skills to, and it can be very fun and very rewarding and um, it has like I said, it has its own kind of personality and its own language and its own value. And so we've put together in the workbook some, some tips for, for that. So a lot of times, you know, I recommend people go with a guide, of course, and certainly I think everybody who's watching this would uh, probably know not to just get out whitewater fly fishing without specific training. Yesterday, we talked a lot about gear. And um, when you get into whitewater fly fishing, that is an important lesson was yesterday in terms of your planning and your process, um, in terms of getting all your gear together, your purpose for being there, what do you want out of it? That starts to get into the level of changing some of what your planning is and what your um, purpose for being out there is, but super fun for, with rapids. Um, phone lines, you guys probably hear the, the silly little term foam is home. When you see a foam line, it's just a bunch of bubbles from river features like runs, riffles, rapids, seams that have now come down into the tail end of a run typically or in a softer piece of water. And that all of that that's going on has created bubbles that now have picked up a lot of different um, micro debris. So that could be pollen, um, some little leaves, just little things that are kind of gathering together. And the reason that, that that matters is it's called a film. It creates a film that now little bugs like midges can get stuck in. So you've got like midges that are kind of now trapped in the film, the surface film. And this is a great place for fish to identify the food coming down in all of this coarse meal come up and eat it out of the foam line. That's why foam is home. A hole is a feature to avoid typically almost always. It's when you've got an obstruction like a rock, the water comes over it and then recirculates back up and toward the rock in a backwards motion and that causes hydraulics. So a hole is really a hydraulic um, at an obstruction and it can trap, you know, um, people, you can trap boats and it's not super fishy. So if you're casting into a hole, your fly is probably may tagging, um, doing the washing machine and it's not a really effective place. However, around holes, you'll find seams, runs, riffles, some other fishy places. Um, a tongue of a river is going to be the glassy part of where you have two fast pieces of water that are moving together into a point, kind of into an arrow point and the glassy part in between them is typically an arrow that kind of points, this is the way to go if you're in a boat. Um, so that's the tongue. If you are in a boat fishing with somebody and they say, put the fly in the middle of the tongue, that means, you know, put the fly kind of right in the middle of that glassy spot as you're cruising down. Maybe you'll be on one side of the fast water or the other, and they're asking you to cast into the tongue. That's what the tongue is. It's kind of leading into what will probably end up as a wave train or a run. 
Uh, next is an overhang. It could be a rock, it could be a tree, but it offers a lot of shelter for fish. It can also be dangerous. It can hook up your fly line, your flies, if you're not paying attention. And in high water, it can cause some constriction. It can cause rapids. Constriction is anything that kind of can push the river together like a canyon or um, just a narrowing. And so sometimes that overhang constitutes something that's coming up like a constriction or a canyon. And um, it can also have a bunch of bugs on it that can fall off terrestrials. So um, bugs that are coming from the, the land and not hatching out of the water and can be a great place to fish. A pool is going to be a piece of water that is above average in volume uh, and, and below average in velocity. So it's going to be kind of bigger and slower. And if you've got a pretty consistent river that's going kind of fast and shallow, and then suddenly it goes slow and deep, that's going to be your pool. That's a good place for fish to harbor. It's a good place for fish to get um, free of any overhead uh, predators like eagles and um, osprey. And it can be a place where the water is cool in the summer and warmer in the winter, a good place for fish to hang out. Um, not an easy place to fish a lot of times because the food isn't always moving. So a lot of times the fish can be very picky because they can take a look forever at whatever you're trying to throw at them and you're not really getting a consistent drift. So it can be a hard place to fish. A lot of times that's gonna be where you'll use a sinking line or a intermediate line and um, fish subsurface as opposed to on the surface of the water with a dry flat. Confluence is going to be the place where two pieces of water come together. So it's probably going to be a braid where you have a river that then splits maybe with a gravel bar in the middle and then it comes together again, that's the confluence or where you have a tributary come into the river, that's gonna be the confluence or where two rivers come together is a confluence. A channel is going to be where the river splits and kind of moves off. Uh, that'll be a channel. One split, one braid will be a channel. A lot of times that is a really fun place to get out of the boat and walk wade or if you're already just walk wading is finding those channels and kind of picking them apart like individual rivers it can also be a dangerous place because typically a channel is going to be meandering, um, going, cutting its own path. And um, that can mean there could be wood in the river. That could be uh, that it runs out of water and suddenly the channel is over. So a channel can be very good fishing, but it can also be a bit dangerous and unexpected. A tributary is going to be a piece of water that's running into the river. So a stream or creek, a lot of times uh, running into the river, you'll see tributaries on the map. They can often be very fun to fish, but they can also be off limits a lot of times because they can be places where fish are spawning. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, the term upstream might sound very basic, but it can be easy to get turned around in a river. So upstream is going to be where the water is coming from and downstream is where the water is going. So that brings us into river right and river left. If you're standing at a river and you're looking downstream, so as the river is flowing and upstream is behind you, river right is going to be on the right and river left is going to be on the left. But if you turn around and now suddenly you're facing upstream, now it's opposite. River right will be on your body's left and river left will be on your body's right. So basically as the river flows, river right is always right. It's never your right, it's the river's right. So river right is always, always, always the right side as the river is flowing. River left is always, always, always the left side of the river as it's flowing down river. The last thing is inside and outside bends. This is important because sometimes you'll hear people say, put the fly on the inside, put the fly on the outside. And to know exactly what that is means that if a river has a bend in it, if it's bending to the left, then river left is the inside, river right is the outside. If it's bending to the right, river right is the inside, river left is the outside. That's important because a lot of times fish will um, want to hang out in the inside bends because they're calmer and a little bit less dynamic typically. And they might have more of a um, gravel inside of a bend as opposed to the outside being um, maybe a harder place for them to hold. There's not as much holding water. It could be pressing up against a rock wall. It could be more dynamic and they're losing energy. 
but that outside a lot of times has the best food. So that's where terrestrials like hoppers, beetles, and ants will be coming off of the bank. Things may be falling out of the trees like spruce moths, and you're just going to have a lot of food moving through that area as opposed to an inside, which also can be like an eddy that can be slower and fish can chill there, but they might not have as much access to food. Phew. I know it's a lot. Awesome. Yeah, Thank you. So what I was going to say is it is a lot, but um, you know, you guys look at the, the recording, you can always review and then seriously do check out the workbook. Um, if you're interested in learning more about any of these features, um, wanted to run through it all just because we're, we're going to hear some of this as we move forward with waterway identification. So thanks Hill. That was awesome. Super helpful. Um, and then, so now that we've kind of identified some of that terminology and, and are familiar with some of those features, we're going to get into waterway identification. Mm -hmm. So for our purposes with this, with this course, um, we're focused on freshwater fishing for trout. So primarily that's going to be streams, rivers, creeks. Um, so with that in mind, we're going to move into some of the waterway, waterway identification for trout streams. Right. So the biggest differences that you'll hear people talk about or the two kinds of rivers that you'll hear people talk about are freestones and tailwaters. A freestone is a river that is free flowing without a dam. A tailwater is going to be the water that's coming out of a dam and they do behave a little bit differently. They have different characteristics that can offer some great fishing and um, great outdoor opportunities that are a little bit different. And, and here's why. A freestone, um, because it the water is coming from nature, essentially it's coming from groundwater, from rainwater and from runoff, which is coming from the mountains in terms of snowpack and glacial runoff. Um, because it's not defined by being released from a dam, it is very dynamic and can change. So obviously we as anglers don't push a button and say, we, are, we want more water here, we don't want more water here, whatever. You might want that, but nature has its own way. And so in a freestone river that is not controlled by a dam, you might have new channels being carved out during runoff, which is the spring thaw when, when there's a lot of water in the river coming from uh, the snow melt from rain and, and um, glacial runoff. And um, it can carve new routes, which means when it carves a new route, now it's got a new batch of rocks to work with. So typically bigger boulders, as opposed to over many, many, many years, as the same consistency of a tailwater that can make a cobble bottom or um, more consistent rock bottom. So if you're fishing behind a dam, below a dam, a lot of times uh, you will have a more consistent stream bed. And that just means the rocks will be a little bit more the same size. Um, there will probably be fewer obstructions, which we'll talk about obstructions here in a minute. And uh, it may not be as dynamic in terms of how much it twists and turns, how many channels it has or braids. Typically a freestone is a little more wild and it kind of does its own thing. You'll also notice that it can be inconsistent in depth and speed. So in a freestone river, you'll see lots of those different things we talked about in the slide before, like runs and riffles and pools and pocket water and rapids. Um, whereas a tailwater, again, is just going to be more consistent because there's typically a consistent amount of water released at specific times coming out of the dam. And so it just is a little bit more moderate. Um, it same goes for the temperature. So water coming out of a dam in a tailwater is, uh, is typically a more um, moderate temperature. So they're able to control how and when they release. Dams are pretty good about controlling um, the, the temperature because they're releasing from the bottom. Back in the day, they used to release from the top and that causes a lot of problems with temperature of water. Um, now they're releasing from the bottom and uh, it's a pretty consistent temperature as opposed to a freestone where when it gets very low and hot and dry in the summer, you don't exactly um, have a handle on when or how that's gonna happen. Um, and this is not to say that you shouldn't look at the stream flows like we talked about yesterday and we were kind of going over some stream flows that you shouldn't look at the stream flows of both. It's important to understand both of them and you'll probably be fishing both of them at 
many different times throughout your life. So it's important to see the differences. A tailwater typically is higher in phosphorus and nitrogen, all the nitrates that are causing um, some real, really great hatches. So a lot of times you'll see some prolific hatches on tailwaters, whereas on a freestone, they tend to be a little bit lower in nitrogen and phosphorus, um, which means that you're going to have uh, a little bit, uh, probably mm, not necessarily less bug life, but less consistent bug life. Um, headwaters and creeks are key because the headwater is the source of the river. So that's where it's coming from. Super important to check your regulations. We went through yesterday, all of your planning and procedures to, to get out to some of these rivers and checking regulations on headwaters and creeks is important because a lot of times there can be special protections in headwaters and they can be key spawning grounds for protected fish. So uh, those headwaters and creeks in Montana typically are opening the third week of May. It's different every state. Check your regulations to make sure that uh, you're even allowed to fish that creek. We've got creeks here in our area that are permanently off limits because they're critical spawning habitat for protected bull trout. Um, we've been mentioning obstructions a little bit. And so I think we can go kind of right into obstructions, Whitney, unless um, anybody has any questions about freestone and tailwater. I know um, I saw in the beginning of the chat when people were talking about where they're from and they're kind of writing, uh, sometimes I identify people with their rivers. So I'm going, oh, that I, know, I know where they are <laughs> because mm -hmm. I can picture that freestone or that tailwater. So um, if people have any questions about freestone and tailwater identification, headwater, creek regulation so far, go ahead and put it in the Q&A and we'll jump back to it. Um, but in the meantime, we can go on to obstructions. So an obstruction is going to be anything that is in the water that is changing or modifying uh, the current. So when we talked about reading water, we talked about identifying and understanding those features and characteristics. A lot of times those are going to be obstructions. So an obstruction can be a big rock or boulder. A lot of times you can see the rock and you're clear that that's an obstruction, but oftentimes there are rocks that are not quite outside of the water where you can see them that are still going to be an obstruction and can still be a hazard and are still very important for you to identify. Whitney, you should talk about your favorite, the frowny rock. Frown, the, <laughs> the rock's frowning at you, don't go there. So yes. the frown, some of the, just in terms of identifying obstructions um, and you're trying to, and, and mostly this applies to, to being in a boat, rowing a boat, fishing from a boat, um, but water that Hillary already talked about, pillows um, and holes, but water pushing up against that rock. If you see that rock on the horizon line of, of the river and it's frowning at you, um, meaning the water isn't smoothly going all the way up and over, water isn't splashing back at you, um, and it's just frowning at you. It, it isn't a hazardous place to be, especially if you're waiting or for your boat. It, if you can reach it with your line, it's a fine place to throw a fly, but in terms of safety for you as an angler, if, if you're trying to identify whether the ro uh, an obstruction is safe to approach, if the water is essentially frowning at you, it's generally frowned. Don't go to town. <laughs> Um, logs and wood. This is the river rafting sign for wood in the water and strainers. Uh, the really the most dangerous thing that you'll come across in the river uh, next to a foot entrapment, which we can go over as well, but is a strainer. So everybody has seen logs in the water, wood in the water, strainers in the water. A strainer is going to be a log or a tree or a root ball that is in the water and those roots and branches are down in the water and they're causing a sieve. So they're just pulling water in faster than you can actually see the speed and velocity, the top of the water. They're pulling everything in and have a tendency to hold it down. That's why you see things gathering into root balls and into log jams, because it can't get out. The water's just going there and it's holding there. And that's what can happen to people if they get um, on or near a strainer. So identifying that is key. Um, I know that it can also be like a siren or a muse again, because you know that fish like wood um, because they offer great habitat, because it can be a, a super good place for bug life and for terrestrials in the fall. But obviously putting your safety first, always try to avoid strainers, always, I mean, not just try, just avoid strainers. 
and then um, position yourself in a place where you can fish safely. You could fish, potentially you can fish logs or wood safely away from getting anywhere where you can lose footing and um, slide into a strainer. So I don't like to fish above or up river of a strainer at all. Um, I'm far less sure footed than I ever was. And if I'm walk wading, I definitely don't want to lose my footing and slide into one. Obviously, as I'm rowing whitewater and I'm guiding people on the river, um, positioning my boat in a way that we're not ever going to be going near one is very key. So uh, we've got in your materials a lot of information about how to wade safely and row safely in terms of avoiding logs, wood, and strainers. Um, a diversion dam is an obstruction that you'll see on a lot of rivers. Um, typically, this will be kind of in farmland where uh, a man-made kind of log or rock looking slide will be. It, typically, it, it's something you can go over or um, it looks like you should be able to go over in certain places, but it's creating kind of a mini reservoir so that the water can be diverted for irrigation or for some other use. Um, a lot of times there's a one way to go in a diversion dam. And if you know your own river, you know where to go. Uh, typically, if you don't know this river, I just avoid going on a stretch with a diversion dam. Uh, it can cause what's called a low head dam, which can cause essentially a hole on the downstream side of that dam. And that is a place where boats can be pinned. And you've seen boats just in there, churn, 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 churn. Or if somebody like loses a water bottle and you see it in there just bobbing around like that, not a safe place to be. It holds you in there for a long time. So a diversion dam is something that is an obstruction to keep in mind. Fences, of course. Um, we are lucky enough in Montana that we've got our Montana Stream Access Law, um, one of the best in the country that we're constantly trying to protect that allows anglers to access the river in a public site and um, like, you know, a public access site, fishing access site or a bridge and then be able to kind of walk up and down the river and fish it below high watermark. Well, a lot of times people, um, landowners are attempting to put fences across spots that are public. And so we're seeing it more and more. So just always try to be aware of fences that aren't very visible. Um, sometimes they can be small wire fences, people just putting them across because they don't want people fishing or floating, just keeping an eye on a fence. Um, boats are an obstruction. So if you are walk waiting or if you're floating and there's a boat downstream or ahead of you, reading water is important to see kind of where you need to go, where you need to walk or where you need to row in order to give that other angler a wide berth and in order to not come too close to them for safety's sake. And clearly, a rapid can also be an obstruction. So a lot of times rapids can be avoided um, as you're, you're floating. It doesn't mean if you're going on a rapid stretch, you can always, you have to go through the rapids. If you know the river or if you're learning the river, um, you can start to become good at skirting rapids. So just going around certain things. You know, if you love running whitewater, then that's an opportunity for some really fun fishing, but not something to jump into right away, of course, as we talked about. And then Whitney, friend or foe? Yeah, so thinking about obstructions, I um, just want to dig into a little bit, you know, we look at rocks, we look at logs or wood, um, rapids even, all of these actually can also create some danger, as you mentioned, but some really uh, tempting fish habitat. Um, and so I want to just dig into a little bit um, the evaluation process of when you're considering an obstruction, whether it's a big rock, um, or a, an overhang, a log somewhere, um, how, how are you weighing the balance between um, the potential for fish in that habitat and the potential for risk, injury, or a threat to your safety? Yeah, I think it's cool to go through any of the features that we had before and features and terminology, and then also the obstructions and start to kind of do like you would do with the pro and con, but say friend or foe, friend or foe. And a lot of times it's both, but it can make a really bad day, change the trajectory of your trip uh, if you're not considering what you need to do, if there are um, pieces of that that are too, that are, that are danger. And, and then tomorrow we're going to talk about making those judgment calls mm -hmm. and kind of what goes through our minds when we're making those judgment calls, because like you said, there's this balance of, oh my gosh, I know there's a fish there that looks rad. I need to get there versus this could go south fast. Totally. And I think 
just to double down on that, it's not just your health and safety. It's also the interest of that giant fish that might be behind that big rock that goes straight into a rapid. So say you get that fish to eat next to a big obstruction that goes directly into a rapid. What does that mean for your ability to retrieve that fish quickly and safely without harming or exhausting the fish? So thinking about your own well-being, it's thinking about the well-being of the fish and just like the full, you know, all the stakeholders. Totally. Super good point that that actually we should have talked about honestly earlier in terms of the reading water is because it's not just this now water that you're in. Okay. I catch a fish. Then what? It's reading the water down river to see what happens after you catch that fish. Maybe you don't try for this fish because it means it's going to have to run toward that strainer and pull you that way, or because it's going to have to run through a rapid, which you don't want to do because you don't want to tire it out. What happens after? Does it go straight into the logs? That's a no-go because you don't want to have to break off that fish and cause it a lot of stress. Um, So super good point. I love that in terms of the um, reading water. It's not just reading where to fish now. It's also what happens after you catch the fish. For sure. So again, that was a lot in terms of identifying what type of stream you're on, different obstructions. Um, The good news, it's stream flow. The good news is that there are a lot of tools to help you. So in in terms of um, being more familiar with waterway identification and reading water, what are some of the tools that you rely on to help you gauge Mm -hmm. all of those different elements? Yeah, this has come become more easy for me over the years because I'm not really a tech person. I, I am. No, (laughs) this may surprise you. (laughs) Whatever. You just asked me how to turn off notifications on your computer. It wasn't beeping the whole time. For goodness sake. Um, I'm not a techie person. And so maps are tricky for me. Graphs are tricky for me. Reading it and making sense of it is tricky for me. So um, a lot of times I'm relying on some of these third-party apps that come off of the more techie stuff. So kind of turning it into a language I understand is key. But the point is that I think this is very important and I use it every single day. So the maps that I'm typically using every day are helping me identify public and um, private land along rivers because I one, I just want, want to know where I am. Um, we talked about land acknowledgement yesterday and just understanding water is something we're talking about today, but understanding the land around that is a huge part of that. So it's understanding public land, understanding um, your access there and your role there, and also who the other stakeholders are as this river is running through. So I use the maps for that, but I also take a zoom out wide look at um, the river in terms of mapping because I want to see where some of those constrictions are like a canyon. I want to see how many times there's an oxbow or a big bend in the river. I want to see how long that straight stretch goes and I'll actually measure it using some of those mapping tools to say to see how long it's one going to take me um, at different river levels and then also how long I have um, between different pieces that I want to fish. clearly you're going to be able to see some of the big obstructions on maps because you'll understand constrictions. You'll understand gradient. The maps will show certain gradients so you can see where rapids are. Um, I I definitely look at maps multiple times a day and uh, we have put into the workbook some key maps that'll be super helpful. We grab some from backcountry hunters and anglers that I use from Onyx maps, a subscription that I have, and um, then just some great public access agency maps um, that, that are helpful for reading rivers and understanding public land. Um, USGS data is key. We talked about it yesterday and we talked about stream flow a little bit, but on the right here, you're looking at one example of a tailwater, the South Platte River out in Colorado. And I put this one up because it just shows how drastically uh, the river levels can change. So this is public information you can get from the USGS, the United States Geological Survey, and every single waterway that you guys will be fishing uh, will have a a system like this that you can see. And so um, it's going to show you CFS or cubic feet per second. And a lot of times it'll also show you depth. And um, there are applications 
on it that as well that can show you um, temperature readings. Um, there are so many different ways to break this down and look at it, but the main point is knowing what the stream flow is, and then you can start to dig into why that matters to your safety, to your fun, and to your fishing. So for example, when it is really high, when you're looking at a spike in your stream flow, if you're on a tailwater and there was a big release from the dam, um, that's going to be a time where a couple different things can happen. One, it could be good for your fishing because it's blowing a lot of um, bugs down. It could be that you were low on water before and so you needed that spike. And so then the, the fish are going to be like fat and sassy and happy. Where we are in our freestone, when we have a big spike like that, it typically means we're getting blown out. The river is not green anymore. It's going to be brown. There's going to be a lot of debris in the water that makes it unsafe and not very fishy. And then the fish will disperse because the river is so wide now and they've got so much um, area with only 600 fish per mile we have here, it's going to be hard to find the fish. And then it's also going to be cold, high, fast. That's something to look at for your safety, for your fun, and for your success. Conversely, when you see through the USGS data that the river is very, very low, you're also going to want to check temperature because that's when things get dangerous for fish. When the river is low, when there's not enough water rolling through, it gets really warm and suddenly the fish start to get very stressed. Anytime you're getting up to 68, uh, 67 degrees, pushing 70 degrees, really that's the time to hang it up and stop fishing. Um, so those are different reasons that I look at the USGS data multiple times a day, every single day throughout the year. Um, tools and resources are just found at fly shops. The fly shops are really great tools and resources. Um, I know I've failed if we're not giving people who walk in the door accurate, up-to-date and quality information um, based on these things that we know coming from you know, the agencies that are supplying this information. So fly shops, I, I really encourage people to check out in the workbook. We've got a link that um, was put together by United Women on the Fly, and it's all of the women-owned fly shops all across the country. I'm not saying you guys need to go to women-owned fly shops, but it's a cool resource to look at, to just see um, the women-owned fly shops near you. But those fly shops will have a lot of classes as well. It could be fly tying classes, it could be casting classes, it could be specific classes about wading, tying knots, waterway management, different things like that, um, and as well as online resources. Yeah, awesome. I think too, we heard from uh, one of the participants from last night who was, had a question, you know, we've really got into Streamflow and um, the USGS data and, um, and a participant last night was like, wow, that seems like a lot. How, like that, that's a lot to bite off. Is this really, you know, is that part of the due diligence that I need to be doing? And really that's up to you in terms of how much you want to know and how much you want to dig into that. But at the very basic level, it gives you a better opportunity to engage either with the local fly shop, um, the group you're with. It just is another touch point for you to have a better understanding and be more in the driver's seat of your experience, understanding what's happening with that waterway. So it's certainly not like, yeah, you had to memorize all these maps and, and um, download all these apps and get really technical with it, but it really is a great opportunity to, to deepen your connection as an angler and to really engage um, with not just the resource, but also the community. Um, so I don't want to definitely didn't, we didn't want to emphasize too heavily that it's really important that you get really technical with all this stuff, but it is a great opportunity that will enhance your full toolkit. Well, yeah, if we're talking about women in fly fishing, what, what you and I, Whitney, are talking about is advancing women in fly fishing. And, and that is, it, it's key that women in fly fishing are engaged in the conversation. So not just yeah. going, not just putting the fly here, not just tying this bug on because that's the one they said in the fly shop, mm -hmm. but understanding why because you've got to be a leader and, and even if you're only leading yourself, you don't have to lead all the people and go do all these things, but you do need to be, in my personal opinion, engaged in understanding what these things mean because if somebody else is telling you, then that means that information is there and you can know that and you can empower yourself and others. You can be empowered by listening and by learning and by continuing to push on. That's what this whole course is meant to be for, is to get that this information is out there and it's not secret. 
um, it's there every single day and it's crucial in my opinion. It's not just like, oh yeah, cool. Like there's a stream flow map and oh, the river's gonna be high. It's like, there's so much in that. What does, what does it mean when the river is high? It could mean that the bull trout reds or the spawning beds are being blown out by unseasonable fall rain on snow events. You know, that sounds like a really big thing, but ultimately what it means is, you know, the fishery could lose a generation of bull trout. Like that's a conversation that people are having. And that's a conversation that there, that can be wildly interesting. And if just going fishing is just your hobby and it's just fun and you don't really care about that stuff, then it's still going to increase yeah. your success and your fun totally. when you know about this stuff, because mm -hmm. you don't want to be out there um, when the river's so high, it's scouring bull trout red. So just at the very, very least, getting deep into this beyond the do this, do that is going to teach you um, enough that you're going to have more fun and more success. Of course, you and I want people to have that deeper understanding mm -hmm. to move women forward, to empower women in fly fishing um, by being part of that extremely engaged piece. And um, I think we can, I think we can have both. Like, I think we can yeah, be sure. and have a ton of fun and have a good time and also just keep it mellow. Like, you know, people are like, oh, it's just fly fishing. It's just, I just want to go out there and have fun. So do I, and so do you. But what we've found is our fun is amped up when we get it, when we understand yeah, sure. more about what's happening out there, you know, way more fun. It's like, and it, when you come to the, all of those conclusions on your own, you know, what fly to use, you know, where to cast, you know, where to wade because you understand everything that's going on behind the scenes. That works. So yeah. it really is. Yeah. It's meant to be an opportunity for empowerment uh, yep. for you all as independent anglers. So yeah. that's actually a great segue into um, this, this term gatekeeping. Yeah. So, um, I want to talk a little bit about that transfer of knowledge mm -hmm. in fly fishing and what you mean by audience gatekeeping. Yeah. So, um, I have a journalism degree. It's really interesting because, um, when I went to journalism school, we talked a lot about gatekeeping because the origin of those word, the word, um, in professional use had to do with um, a, a newsroom. Um, so the early, early origin of the word gatekeeping was the, the mother in a home who was pretty much the head of the household. And so she would decide what the family ate. She would decide when the family went to sleep. She would decide what we did on Sundays. She, you know, the, kind of the mother was the gatekeeper. That's the first origin of the word. And then she then can help the family, you know, decide what to do essentially by telling them, these are your options. This is, this is what you could do, but she's the gatekeeper and she's moving that information through disseminating it through the family. Um, it gets more complicated when kids say, I don't like this and I don't like that and I don't like this and I don't like that and they change it. And, and that's kind of where it starts to morph into information dissemination. So working in television news, the gatekeepers were the people in the newsroom who had gone out into the field and gathered the information. So basically we're the only people at that point that had the information because we went out and got it and now we have it. And now it's our responsibility to disseminate the truth. So disseminate the actual um, accurate, truthful information was what we were charged with as news anchors and news reporters back um, when I was working in that business. And that was, that was the use of the word gatekeeping. We were the gatekeepers giving the um, truthful dissemination of information out to the public. Now, if you think of a, an angler, an experienced angler, a veteran angler, a guide, an outfitter, a fly shop pro as the gatekeeper, that means they've probably gone out and got a bunch of original information either over years or maybe it was that morning they did a reconnaissance mission on their favorite hole and, and um, they're you know kind of understanding a lot about what's going on out there. Um, now it's their responsibility to disseminate that information responsibly. So it can be um, trying to give people the accurate information that's going to be helpful to them and keep them safe. And that's the responsibility of trained professionals. It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to give away all of your secrets. That's not what that means. You're not required to go out there uh, and wear a shirt that says fish here and do this, but it does mean that you now have that opportunity to do something with the information. And that's quite the responsibility. That's kind of the gatekeeping. 
where gatekeeping has come into this modern age and has changed a little bit is where the gate is just closed. The gate isn't necessarily ever opening. So people have the information and they're not giving it at all. And mm -hmm. that's kind of the critical, the criticism of modern day gatekeeping is the people who have information are keeping it um, from the public. And a lot of times the public is a public that doesn't have an opportunity to necessarily get it for themselves. They don't have access to the resources. They don't have access to um, clean and safe water or um, don't have a mentor or something. So, so it can be, it, that's where you, you hear in modern day discussions of gatekeeping um, that, that it can be critical. Now, what I'm talking about when we're talking about audience gatekeeping is next level because the audience gatekeepers are the ones who have taken the gatekeepers information that was somehow disseminated typically through a valid news source. Um, maybe it is through a fly shop or maybe it is through an agency like the Forest Service, Park Service, USGS, a reputable agency that's given information out there. Now, a, a audience gatekeeper has taken that information and then maybe shaken it up a little bit and kind of reconstructed it to be something that they want for their audience and then re-disseminated it. So it's a little bit like playing telephone where the information changes a little bit based on who gets it and who uses it in a certain way and then who sends it back out there. The reason this matters for our tools and resources discussion is because all of these tools and resources that are out there, people have access to and maybe have taken in, have kind of shaken up a little bit, maybe even for better or worse, but it somehow changed it, um, modified it, enhanced it in some certain way, turned it into an app, turned it into something else, and then re-disseminated it. So, why we say ha have caution with audience gatekeeping is because you've got to kind of go to the headwaters of that information. So the source, where did the information come from in terms of making sure that it's accurate and that it's safe. Um, and the reason that that matters is because if you're, we have on here, we're encouraging people to go look at online resources. Um, that scares me a little. So what I'm trying to tell people is a caveat, go look online for information, but please use caution that there is a lot of stuff online that has been modified by audience gatekeepers. So that has been changed or shaken up or, or rebuilt for a specific audience. And, um, and, and that's just out, you'll just find that. You'll just, you know, you'll just see stuff out there that uh, isn't necessarily from a reputable source. Maybe not directly from folks who know or is from people who want, want you to do the things that they're saying to do for a specific reason, maybe for a marketing reason, maybe because they want you to um, go fish in a, in a different way, in a different place for a different fish, something like that. So hopefully, you know, there, we, we don't have um, people here with us right now, you know, that we can talk to and see heads bobbing, but hopefully people understand kind of what, what, what that means. Um, basically, it just means be careful when looking at things online. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I think it does matter because fly fishing is trending. There's so many different um, marketing tax tactics out there, particularly for new anglers. And also, I think the other thing that we've talked about is that women specifically are faced faced with this impossible challenge of trying to increase visibility for women in the sport, trying to increase representation of women in this sport, trying to empower other women. Uh, within the sport and doing all of those things visibly while at the same time not compromising integrity, safety, skill and ability, any of those things. So I think it just comes, it really emphasizes the bottom line of this whole presentation, which is inject yourself into every step that's happening. So you have a, a real understanding of all of those different moving parts. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we've talked about what reading water means. We've walked through a lot of the features, the terminology used. We've talked about some of the tools you can utilize to have a better, uh, improve your ability to read water. So the next step is getting to the actual water for fishing. Yeah. So let's talk about access a little bit. Um, again, for our uh, purposes in this course, we're talking about freshwater fishing for trout. So um, that said, let's hone in a little bit about what access to trout water looks like. Mm -hmm. 
So typically you are going to be waiting or you're going to be floating. One, or, one of, of those two things, you're not out in the ocean, you're typically going to be waiting or floating. And you can be, you know, bobbing in a lake, I count that as floating. Um, so um, we don't talk a ton about, about that because this course is about reading water and water dynamics, which certainly there are a lot of dynamics out in a, in a lake or a pond too. Um, but typically for freshwater trout fishing and water identification, we're talking about a river. So you'll either be waiting on this river or you're going to be floating. You talked about getting to this point. And I think that's the most important part when we're addressing accessing water is that yesterday we talked about planning and purpose and going over um, what do you need to kind of get to this point where you're now ready to access it. So we took you through all of that yesterday and then today talking about identifying these water features and obstructions and now we're ready to do it, like we're ready to kind of get out there and take a look at it. So whether you're waiting or floating, you're going to have to consider stream flow. We talked about those tools and how to measure it and how to look at it. But as you're approaching it, you're certainly able to, now that you've learned those things, understand what is happening with the stream flow. So some of the things that you might see is in this picture um, on the slide, I'm there uh, with one of my clients, Barbara. And before we even get into the run, which is the deeper kind of greener piece that you see just out in front of us, we're looking at the different features. One of the features um, that we're looking at is that there's a, a boat down below us. It's not our boat, but there's a boat down there, meaning there's some there's other anglers. And so we're kind of taking everything into consideration. But the stream flow is key because this is one of the ones where I'm anticipating that the fish we're gonna be targeting are gonna be in the middle of that run, that deeper part there. So um, if there was bigger stream flow, it wouldn't be right in that specific spot. And if there was less, it wouldn't be in that specific spot either. We'd be looking for a deeper pool. Um, terrain is key. So whether you're waiting or you're um, floating, this has to do with not only how you're waiting in the water or um, rowing in the water, but getting to it. So accessing it, kind of getting actually to the river has a lot to do with terrain. Um, it, I remember Whitney, you and I scaled down this crazy scree cliff to go fish this spot. And then I thought that there was a grizzly bear because you gave the sign, she was doing this, like there was a bear to get the hell out of there. And I scrambled up the cliff and got out of there and she never came. And I was like, oh, she got eaten by a bear. Well, that's that. She's sister's gone. She finally came. She'd been waving her hands like that, not because there was a bear, but because she put a woolly bugger right through her lip. The point is that was a terrible place for us to try to go fishing because it was super hard to access and super hard to get out of there in case of an emergency. So customizing your approach is thinking about terrain and also how these different things change in different seasons. So the seasonality is key because a lot of times we have people say, oh, the river is fishing awesome in, in October, and then they come to try back in June and it's completely different river. So thinking about customizing it for you for that day, for that season, um, and then thinking about what species you're targeting. This is key because the more you start to learn about the different species, the more you learn about their wants and needs. The fish that need super cold, clean water, the fish that can tolerate different um, riffles, the fish that maybe are strong enough to be in pocket water, you start to look and learn about these different species and that will help customize your approach when you're waiting or when you're floating. The a really important thing to drive home, we talked a lot about yesterday is regulations and licensing. Customizing the way that you access water, getting there and then once you're there is super uh, key with regulations and licensing. So that'll go state to state. A lot of times um, different waterways will have different regulations. Again, We've given you a link to where you can check regulations in your state. And when you do that, do it often and um, don't assume that it's not going to change. Regulations are changing all the time. So constantly checking that is super important. And then as you're accessing water, looking into um, what's happening with the ecosystem and some ecological concern is key. So a riparian zone or riparian area is going to be kind of the natural filter along the sides of the river. So a lot of times it's spongy and could be muddy and it's got 
um, a, a lot kind of growing there and a lot happening, but it can be very sensitive too. So it can be easily injured. So being careful of, of, around riparian zones is really important to the quality of the water. It's a natural filter and um, it's kind of keeping too much sediment and debris and pollution from getting into the river in a natural way. So being careful around those zones is really important. For example, not cutting down um, trees and um, tying boats off and jumping around in them and, and um, digging and letting dogs run around in riparian zones is key. Reds, that's your um, fish bed. So essentially you're, that's where uh, the fish are doing the dirty and, and their eggs are gonna be. And that's where you need to um, let them do their thing and avoid and not be walking on reds. Super important to be able to identify reds. We've given a link to that as well in the workbook. Um, and it will give you visual cues for what to look for. Typically the way a fish builds the red is using its tail to um, kind of clean off an area that suddenly looks pretty bright. Once you've seen one, you can identify them really well. It's really a, a nest, a bright circle um, in, in the river and uh, identifying those and avoiding them is really important. And then also uh, when fish are spawning and where and understanding those creeks and what's happening in those creeks in terms of fish population is super important. Anything else to add in those? No, I think that's awesome. Other than we did all of this is in the in the workbook in terms of, you know, some videos, tools, articles on on identifying reds. Um, so I think, you know, just good resources to have. Good. Public land and water, um, we have accessing water in in this slide. And, and typically when we, we're talking about, we're talking about your physical um, access. How are you going to get to it? What's your kind of approach? But public land and water access is a huge, huge important thing to be very dialed in on. Again, I talked about the Montana stream access law and public lands, but state to state, it's very different. And one thing I can tell you, it seemed to me, it's a little bit about more than knowing what's happening now. And it can be about how things can change and what you have to lose or what you have to gain as um, somebody who cares about um, sh our shared lands and understands land acknowledgement and that privatizing a lot of these places where we fish can be, you know, j is such a hot topic and is always being talked about and that we as anglers can be part of that conversation. So um, I think staying on top of that is key wherever you live and with whatever waters you're dealing with. Um, and so we've, again, given links for that as well. Um, I really encourage people when we have this discussion to be very careful to not trespass because trespassing is a real good way to lose um, trust in, in agencies and in private land owners and, um, and then lose our public access. So uh, know, know your rights as a angler and, um, and don't disobey the law, but like fight to have these public access um, laws strengthened and, and so we don't lose them. So um, that's my little spiel on that, but there's tons of information about um, how to learn more about your public lands and water access and um, how to be a good citizen and a good neighbor for sure. Um, we talked yesterday about aquatic invasives and got a, a lot of feedback from people about kind of what some of those were where they lived. And I think it's so important when you're traveling to fish that that's top of mind because ultimately if you're going to a different waterway, you're kind of potentially bringing your baggage with you. And if that has aquatic invasives, that's really bad. <laughs> And nobody wants you to come fish there if you're just going to bring their zebra mussels with you. So um, think about keeping your gear clean and dry and inspected on your boats and understand that as you're accessing water, um, which aquatic invasives are there so that you're also not bringing them back and uh, which aquatic invasives are where you are so that you're not transporting them to another place. Yeah, for sure. Awesome, Hill. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I want to leave a little bit of time if there are any questions. Um, mm -hmm. Questions can be either about reading water, access, um, any of the things we've talked about tonight or any follow-ups from last night in terms of planning, preparation, um, finding your purpose. 
If there are questions, uh, go ahead and throw them in the Q&A chat um, and we'll give it a minute. Hillary, any other closing thoughts for you in terms of waterway identification, reading water, any like key takeaways as we close it out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I would encourage people to ask questions too about things that we didn't talk about, either that you wish that we would, so we can develop that into something in the future or answer it now, uh, or things that you'd like to see uh, talked about in the future, something that we can work on for sure. Obviously, an hour and a half is not a ton of time and we're not in person on the water like you and I'd like to be, um, but we do have those classes in person in August and in October. And um, you can see those on the She Jumps website and uh, those will be kind of a recurring thing every single year as will the online ones. So definitely encourage people to, um, to check those out and sign up. Um, Vanessa is asking, how long do the zebra mussels live? Do you have to wash right away or will they die after a time? So you, you, sh you should really wash right away because of, of the transporting. So um, super important to kind of get them off of there so that they're not even just moving from one place to another. But typically they need to have kind of that wet environment. So they're, they're not going to really live outside of that environment for a super long time, just like kind of any other muscle. Um, but with that said, they can live long enough to survive being transported across the country. Yeah, especially if that pair of boots or that boat is going right back to the water somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. that, that three important elements, but clean, drain, dry, it's really that dry that's, that's pretty important if you're gonna be transporting or traveling around. I don't, know the, I don't know the actual answer for the length of time, actual time. I think it, a lot of it's situational based on how wet it is and what kind of environment it's in when it's being transported. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, if it's being transported on your boots or your boat, uh, it's got to, you, you need to try to get those washed off pretty quick. Um, for unfamiliar water, when are you looking at the USGS gauges for flow? Mm -hmm. When you are looking, excuse me, when you are looking at the USGS gauges for flow, do you have any rule of thumb or type guidance on CFS F thresholds and weightability? Yes, I do for my river. So, I encourage everybody to become accustomed to what that means where you are because we're on a freestone here. And so yesterday we talked about keeping journals and um, a lot of this technical information somewhere where you can look back at it year to year. If I haven't done that, the USGS does it for you and you can look back at the history and you can look back at over time um, when rivers peaked and make note about when they were fishing and when they weren't. So that information kind of stays but if you've kept it for yourself, then, then you know how a river is going to be fishing at a certain level. So, you know, for example, for us here on the middle fork of the flathead, we also use a foot gauge as well at like, not a, not a toe foot gauge, a, a 12 inch foot gauge um, on a couple bridges that can show you uh, essentially like a reference point. So if the river is flowing at four and a half feet, I know that it's super fun whitewater and a couple of my favorite fishing holes are probably going to be super fishy and really good, but I don't know what four and a half feet um, or 7,500 CFS means in another river. You saw the gauge from the South Platte that was like a hundred CFS or something like super, super tiny. Um, that's not something that we would even see here on the flathead. Uh, our CFS is going to be constantly a lot higher just because we've got bigger flows, it's a bigger river. So it means something different for everybody else. So yes, you should come up with a threshold or a rule of thumb um, for your own river, absolutely. That can be in CFS or it can be in feet because the USGS publishes both. And I literally write it down, take pictures, document, talk with people. And in the fly shops, you'll talk about when something is safe and when something is fishing based on that threshold for your river. Anything else to add with that? Hi, Christy. I'll unmute. <laughs> <laughs> nice work, ladies. Any other questions? Cool yeah, deal. <laughs> See, that's what happens when you're incredibly thorough, ladies. <laughs> <laughs>
Awesome. Well, I just want to thank Wit and Hillary again for this evening. We'll be back tomorrow night. So if you're not signed up for that, please do. I'll send out a reminder as well. You'll get this recording so you can watch it again and again and again. Um, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Ladies, any closing words? Uh, no, I just, I think that again, like it's so, so much. If, if anybody takes anything away from this, I hope that it's becoming engaged um, in what the deeper meaning of all of this stuff is. It's not, I don't mean double rainbow, what does it all mean? But literally there are answers in here that will help your fishing and your fun and your safety and your success. And as opposed to just pushing the button, do this, cast here, do that, is really understanding that. And I, I wanna clarify in the last question too, Aaron was asking about in unfamiliar water. So I, my, I should get back to saying, go to the fly shop and talk to the professionals and ask around because they will know and there's no threshold for unfamiliar water because it's unfamiliar. That's my answer for that. Very cool. Such pros. Thanks for the opportunity, you, Christy. <laughs> Appreciate it very much. Thank you all for joining. Thanks awesome. guys. Thank you all, and we'll see you tomorrow, tomorrow night. We'll see you yeah. tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow <laughs> night is uh, goals and um, weighing risk and fun. Awesome. Thank you all. Have a great one. See ya.